Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here. I hope everyone's commute was uneventful. I want to first thank our teams at VTrans and municipal employees for the long hours working overnight and today plowing the roads. We very much appreciate all the good work. Speaking of roads, today we want to focus on the importance of planning ahead and investing in our critical infrastructure needs. In my budget address, as you might recall, I talked about the more than $150 million in surplus dollars we proposed in the budget to make sure we can leverage even more federal dollars over the next few years. Between all the federal programs passed recently, like the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation and Reduction Act, billions more will be available to the states, in addition to all the ARPA money we're currently spending. But unlike ARPA, these programs are more traditional and require states to match a percentage of the money themselves in order to receive the federal money. And the return on investment is incredible. We will receive a minimum of four federal dollars <clears throat> for every dollar we invest. And in some cases, it's 10 times that amount. And here's the good news. We don't have to worry about where that match will come from because we have the money right now. This year, we have a record amount of state surplus, which is why I believe it would be wise to do, dedicate 150 million of it to guarantee these funds are available when we need it. The reason I'm advocating for this set aside is that we really don't know how the economy is going to do over the next few years. At our e-board meeting in January, the legislature's own economists told us we are likely to see revenue growth drop significantly in the coming years. That means we might not have the match money we need, putting important projects at risk, also putting us in a tough position of either cutting programs or raising taxes, and neither are good options. This is really about fiscal responsibility and good government, thinking ahead and being prepared. Dedicating the funding now would also provide certainty to our communities and the partners who do the work so they can plan ahead. And if there is an economic downturn, as many predict, the economic activity these projects provide will help people stay employed and our economy moving. Secretary Moore and Flynn will go into more detail about the much needed infrastructure we're talking about and Mayor Lair from Rutland and Katie Buckley from VLCT will talk about how communities benefit from these investments. Because as I said in my budget address, this investment is all about communities, like work on Route 78 in Swanton, Route 2 between Cabot and Danville, Route 5 in Brattleboro, and connecting their regions with safe roads and clean water with projects in Bethel, Northfield, and Rutland not to mention the significant amount of broadband funding as well. We have a golden opportunity to be pragmatic and help assure that our infrastructure and economic needs are met in the future. And I'm hopeful the legislature sees the merits of the strategy as well. I'll now turn it over to Secretary Flynn for more. Uh, thank you, Governor, and good afternoon. The Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act has positioned Vermont to realize the largest dedicated transportation infrastructure investment, likely since the onset of the Eisenhower Interstate Highway System. Vermont's transportation program is funded from the Federal Highway Administration in five-year cycles referred to as Fast Act Reauthorization. This most recent five-year cycle is delivering $1.7 billion to the Agency of Transportation, which is an increase of $572 million from the prior five-year cycle. With that comes additional pressures, as you've heard the governor say, to have the required state match, which in our case is typically 20%, to draw down those federal dollars. As the governor has said, ensuring right now that Vermont has secure and dedicated match money to utilize these federal funds to deliver increased transportation projects across our state 
just makes sense. And it will guarantee our ability to leverage this historic opportunity at that return on investment of four to one. The governor's as recommended budget for 24 identifies $79 million from the current general fund surplus for fiscal 24, 25, and 26. This will put $342 million in transportation projects to work across Vermont. As a general practice, there is never a more cost-effective time to plan and to begin large construction projects than the present. Failure to secure this funding now can have ripple effects across the entire project delivery pipeline, delaying our ability to advertise, to go to bid, and to award contracts. Of 754 projects as of today, 223 transportation projects across Vermont will have their delivery schedules impacted over time. A few examples of actual projects in real impacts are in Orwell, reconstruction of shoulders and widening Route 22A. Construction is currently planned for 2027 and it would be delayed until 2030. In Cabot to Danville, reconstructing US Route 2. Construction is planned to begin in 2026 and would be delayed until 2029. In Norton, up in Essex County, replacing bridge number 41 on Route 114. Construction is planned for 2028 and it would be delayed until 2032. In Franklin, replacing sidewalks on Main Street. Construction is planned to begin in 2023 and it would be delayed until 2025. Wolcott, replacing Bridge 6. Construction is planned to begin in 2025 and would be delayed until 2027. In West Rutland, U.S. Route 4, replacing bridge decks on Bridge 13 and 14, both east and westbound. Construction is planned to begin in 2029. It would be delayed until 2035. And Brattleboro, reconstruction of U.S. Route 5, Putney Road. Construction is planned to begin in 2028 and it would be delayed until 2033. But locking in these funds now will yield faster, more predictable projects, as the governor said, with substantial long-term savings, guaranteeing that federal investment of at least four to one. And it does also ensure that we aren't put in a position in leaner economic times to make difficult decisions over what to cut or what taxes and fees to raise to cover the increased state match realities. Doing this now will allow Vermont communities and our industry partners the predictability to plan and to get things moving on these projects sooner. And you can see from the map, the projects at risk cover counties and towns across the state of Vermont. Vermonters need to be aware of these projects and they need to be aware of the delays to these projects if match is not secured with certainty. And now I would introduce Secretary Julie Moore. Good afternoon. I think it probably can go without saying, but Vermont has some of the oldest infrastructure in the country, and with age comes a whole lot of need. Part of the challenge with water infrastructure, which is the centerpiece of the Agency of Natural Resources, is that it's often out of sight and therefore out of mind. But just because it doesn't have our full attention, it can't be assumed to be working well. Water infrastructure is often the most valuable asset a community owns, with the total value of pumps, pipes, and treatment plants exceeding $50,000 for each household that's connected to the system. This valuable infrastructure requires significant ongoing investments to properly maintain it and prevent challenges to public health, the environment, economic growth, and climate resilience. Based on agency projections, there will be roughly $2 billion of investment needed in water infrastructure. This means drinking water, wastewater, and stormwater over the next 10 years alone in Vermont. This is to both refurbish existing systems and to prepare this essential infrastructure for the increasingly disruptive and potentially devastating effects of climate change. Fortunately, you, we are at a unique point where there is unprecedented federal resources available to invest in water infrastructure. Vermont is eligible to receive an infusion of nearly $320 million into our state revolving loan funds as part of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. 
The Revolving Loan Fund Program is an EPA partnership that provides communities with grants and low-cost financing for a wide range of water infrastructure projects. In order to access these federal funds, however, Vermont needs to provide $27 million in state match, and the governor's FY24 recommended budget creates a reserve that ensures Vermont will have that required match. These resources will be used to support dozens of projects, as shown on the map to my right, and rolls up to things like $155 million to refurbish existing drinking water and wastewater systems to ensure that this core infrastructure continues to support vibrant communities, nearly $150 million to support lead service line replacement projects across Vermont, which will improve drinking water quality, and more than $40 million during the same time period to address emerging contaminants like PFAS by improving drinking water and wastewater treatment. These projects are significant undertakings, as Secretary Flynn spoke to, that require robust planning and engineering design. This means that there's often a long lead time needed for a community to ready a water infrastructure project for implementation. And given the level of effort, needed lead time, and competing demands on community priorities, confidence that this funding will be available to support implementation when the time comes is critical. If Vermont were to forego making the commitment this fiscal year, it will add uncertainty for communities, making it harder and potentially more expensive to plan for and execute on these critical projects. In fully committing the state funds to access literally hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars in federal resources, it makes clear Vermont's commitment to supporting our communities and investing in critical water infrastructure projects. And with that, I will turn it over to Katie Buckley from the League of Cities and Towns. Hi there. Uh, during the summer of 2021, 276 towns, cities, and villages across Vermont took a big leap in accepting over $200 million in local American Rescue Plan Act funds. Many who have never worked with federal money before accepted it with fear, anxiety, and uncertainty of what it really meant to manage and spend these dollars without final rules for them even being established yet. They accepted this money with the hope and promise that their local ARPA money can unlock and leverage additional grants that would soon follow through the Infrastructure Investments and Jobs Act, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, and the Inflation Reduction Act. Over the last 18 months, communities of all sizes and capacity levels across the state have taken their time, been patient, and are thinking bigger. They understand that if there was ever a moment to be strategic and take advantage of one-time money to help make big investments to repair and replace crumbling infrastructure or develop new infrastructure, now is that moment. It's a rare opportunity, one that most of us in this room will never see again. Towns, cities, and villages can use their local ARPA money as much needed grant match to leverage other federal dollars. Often towns, big and small, struggle to come up with that grant match. But now, with ARPA, they have it in hand, rare. They're relying on the state of Vermont to pull down its share of federal money that's available now so that we, all of us, can emerge from this moment stronger and more resilient. With so many competing priorities, it's hard to set aside the state's share of grant match, but it is critical to do so in this moment. If we do not, we lose this rare opportunity. Crumbling infrastructure itself will not heal. New infrastructure to meet our housing crisis, climate initiatives, and make us safer and more resilient will not just magically appear. All of it is necessary. If we do it now, Vermonters win. If we do it later, Vermonters lose. We will put this work off and onto the backs of taxpayers with a growing price tag, and we push Vermont deeper into a crisis of affordability. Our towns, cities, and villages are waiting for the state to deliver these federal dollars so that they can do their part to make transformational changes in their communities. We're grateful to the governor and his administration for the working so hard to bring these dollars to Vermont to ensure this happens. And at this point, I'll pass it to Mayor David Allaire. Okay. for this purpose because this is exactly what we did with setting aside $400,000 from our ARPA allocation of $4.5 million for the same reason, to have readily available matching funds for state and federal grant opportunities. It's a good strategy, whether it's 
water, sewer, or stormwater infrastructure, or traditional roads and bridges, good infrastructure can open up so many opportunities for our cities and towns. For example, Roland has $7.85 million in bond requests on the ballot on town meeting to continue our aggressive schedule of infrastructure improvements, which are so vital to our economic development efforts. You know, as mayor, I also know it's important to plan ahead. Sometimes you don't see the fruits of your investments you make right away, but that doesn't mean they're not worthwhile. Since first being elected, our DPW commissioners, first Jeff Weinberg and now Jim Rotundo, have worked closely with state government to identify projects and available funding from the various sources for our infrastructure needs. You know, good government, anticipating needs and being proactive and having a degree of, a degree of certainty helps people plan. That's why it makes all kinds of sense for the state to set aside this money now while we have it in surpluses to ensure we can take full advantage of federal funds in the years to come when we don't know if state coffers will be as full. As the governor mentioned, knowing we had projects on the horizon and the funding to achieve them can also help keep people employed, which is so important, and the economy moving, moving if we see tougher economic times ahead, as many people predict. So to close, I believe the state of Vermont, as well as the citizens of Rutland, will benefit from this strategy as we stretch federal dollars as much as we can and plan for the future for our children and grandchildren. So thank you again for this opportunity. I appreciate it very much. It's good to see everyone. And I will now hand it back to the governor. Thank you very much, Mayor. And uh, at this point in time, we'll open up to questions. Governor, are you hearing from your colleagues in the legislature a, a willingness or a desire not to set aside match money? I mean, I know the legislature is still building their budget, but have you heard of any of them not doing this? I'm hearing a little bit of both. Uh, there are some legislators that are fully supportive of making sure that we have the money we need for match, and then I'm hearing from others um, maybe they had other priorities uh, for surplus dollars. So I'm, I'm hearing a mixed mix response. We want to make sure uh, the message is loud and clear. This is very important to me, and, uh, and I think that it's important to the state of Vermont. It's important to our economy uh, to make sure that we have these dollars that we have right now that we can invest in these projects for the future. And uh, there's no better time than now to set that aside. Of course, it raises, the, with all of these infrastructure projects, the question about workforce as well. I know that's been, especially for the water and sewer and road projects, how are we faring and how are we looking as these monies are coming down the pike in terms of our, our workforce to build these out? Yeah, there's no doubt uh, we have a workforce shortage in the state. We talk about that a lot. Um, but, uh, but I will say um, the industry has, seems to have been able to keep up. Uh, in fact, I've heard from some who are looking for work at this point in time. So again, with a possible downturn in the economy, uh, having this money and making sure there's some predictability in the future, some certainty, uh, will keep the economy rolling. And uh, I think everyone is wondering, how will, how will this land? Uh, how will the economy land? And uh, when will the inflation stop? And when, when will we need uh, this? And, and I think, uh, I think it uh, has a lot of merit to put it aside and make sure that we're prepared right now. Um, Secretary Flynn listed off a number of projects that could face multi-year delays if Vermont is, is not able to come up with the matches. Um, are you saying that those delays would come to pass if lawmakers don't allocate the match money in FY24? If we don't have the match money in general, uh, because I'm not sure that we'll have it in the future, um, because we don't know if we're going to have surpluses. Uh, we've been very fortunate in the six years I've been governor, uh, about at least half of them, we've had surpluses. Uh, but previous to that, um, there was a long stretch uh, where we had no surplus. In fact, we had deficits. And uh, I've been in business, I've been in the state, I've been in this legislature 
uh, I'm part of this institution uh, for a number of years in business uh, over three decades in this, in, in this environment uh, over two decades. I've seen the ups and downs in our economy and a lot of folks here have not. And uh, I know, uh, I remember uh, scraping together, trying to find match money uh, so that we can move uh, these projects forward and not being able to do it and delaying projects as a result. Again, these dollars require a match from the state. And if we don't have the match, then we don't get to do the projects. So I'm very concerned about that. I just want to make sure that we, we focus on this because this will give, give us and the state certainty that these projects will come to bear. We, we saw the state's infrastructure grades come out last week, um, kind of emphasizing the need to improve roads, bridges, uh, everything that you guys are saying. Um, but what does that C grade mean to you specifically? Does it just really enforce what you guys are saying today? Well, we have uh, done better in a couple of areas. I think our bridges, uh, we, we, we increased our rating, which is good news. Uh, I believe a lot of that, um, and this is maybe the uh, secretary can weigh in on this as well, but I think that was a result of Irene. Um, we received a lot of federal dollars to replace uh, a number of bridges that helped us catch up a bit. Uh, again, if not for that federal money, I'm not sure that we'd be in that position today. So we rely on a federal funding in the state um, in almost every way. And I, and I think we have to, we have to weigh uh, what's happening in Washington at this point. Um, we've, uh, we've already, uh, they've extended themselves uh, quite a bit. I think they're going to be pulling back, I think without Senator Leahy uh, there as well. We won't be receiving a lot of the federal money we've been, uh, we've been counting on over the last few years. So all of that together um, brings me to the point where if we have the money now, let's make sure that we invest it in the right way uh, so there's some certainty for the state of Vermont. And, and I'll say again, um, areas um, in cities like Rutland, for instance, with some of the oldest water infrastructure in the state. Uh, some of that, Mayor, uh, I think it's over 100 years old, if I remember right. Uh, 125, actually. Yeah. So, so again, it's exceeded its useful life, uh, and this will give us what we need. It won't catch us up. Um, we'll still need to continue um, making these investments with our own state money and with regular um, uh, federal money that comes our way, um, but this will help us advance. And, and maybe uh, next time uh, with the, uh, the engineers coming out with their, their grading, uh, that maybe we'll move up the ladder again. Do you want to talk about that at all, anything? Oh, right. sure. <clears throat> um, thanks, Governor. Specific to the uh, pavement condition, road condition, and bridge report in the uh, engineering study released last week, uh, the Agency of Transportation has a very um, thorough and robust asset management program. And it, it is driven to help us choose the right projects at the right time um, in the right place, if you will, to repave or to redeck bridges and, and things like that. So we are fortunate to be far ahead of the national average on bridge deficiency rating. And we, I think, have 28% of our pavement in Vermont <clears throat> is poor or, or very poor which is an improvement, but it's not good enough because if that's where you live, it's 100% of your experience. And we recognize that. But the other thing I would say is infrastructure, you never reach a static completion. It, everything is deteriorating right now as we talk. Every road we repaved five years ago is deteriorating. So I think one of the things that the governor is trying to point out is this opportunity for this historic uptick in funding to, to make us able to get so much more done than we would otherwise is really just something that we should capitalize on. Governor, slightly unrelated, but a town meeting day break is coming up. Week, two weeks, sessions flying by. How, how, what's your assessment of 
as you mentioned, lots of new lawmakers, new energy in the building. How, how is this session uh, going for you and, and some of your priorities that you've advocated for? Well, again, um, a lot of the budget adjustment, um, the, the dollars that we put forth in that uh, were included. Uh, that's the good news. There were some areas that we have um, we saw as problematic, and they're working their way through that right now. I'm hopeful uh, that we'll be able to come to agreement uh, in the end on that. So. Uh, getting the budget adjustment pass is important before town meeting uh, break. And then we'll see. I mean, there's some other good news. I mean, let's talk about good news uh, for a bit. Uh, the housing uh, bill that the Senate passed out of committee, um, that's a great bill. It, it has a lot of attributes. Um, we'll see what happens to it when it goes through Senate Natural Resources um, and gets through appropriations and then goes over to the House. But at this point in time, it's a strong bill moving in the right direction. So there are a number of initiatives that, uh, that have been, um, I see as positive, um, but, um, but we have a long ways to go. And, I, and there's, some, you know, there's some storm clouds on the horizon. What have you made about the Affordable Heat Act? Um, there's a storm cloud uh, <laughs> that I'm seeing. Um, again, I, as you know, I vetoed uh, the uh, clean heat standard last year for a variety of reasons, one of them uh, being that it went to the Public Utility Commission without coming back to the legislature for full review and passage uh, as, a, as a bill. And um, it appears that's moving, as it came out of Central Natural Resources, uh, moving that same direction. So I'm, uh, I'm very concerned about that. Um, I think in these times, I think, uh, again, Vermonters are looking for more certainty, and uh, this gives them anything but certainty in the future. And I'm just not convinced that we're prepared. Um, we have the same goals, uh, but, uh, but I think their timeline is uh, very aggressive, and, and I'm not sure it's attainable, especially after coming back. I think we talked about this last week in the uh, press conference uh, about my experience uh, at the National Governors Association uh, being part of, uh, of one task force uh, looking at the grid in particular. And I'm not sure if we have the capacity at this point in time to do that. And I, again, I think about they're all worthy goals, um, but when you become uh, more pragmatic and, and look at the practical aspect of this, take, for instance, um, if you have a, uh, someone living in a mobile home, for instance, uh, paying six bucks a gallon right now for kerosene uh, because they have above ground fuel tanks and it has to be a lighter grade so it doesn't freeze. So they're already paying a buck more uh, than number two fuel at least. So they're gonna continue to pay that money uh, unless, and it could be more because their fuel supplier uh, now has to buy, uh, appears, would have to buy some uh, credits, which will cost money. They'll have to pass that on to customers. So this person in the mobile home will have to pay more money for fuel, unless, of course, they decide to put in a heat pump or they get a, a vehicle uh, that uh, it's electric. And um, But when you think about like a typical mobile home or a, or a house that's been built um, pre-1972, which there are a lot of them in Vermont, they all have 16 amp services um, to have a heat pump and uh, to, to charge up your vehicle. You're gonna need a minimum of a 100 amp service in, that, in, that, in your home. So you take a mobile home, for instance, that's maybe valued at $8,000, and you ask an electrician to put in retrofit a new uh, box, a 100 amp box or, or bigger, it's going to cost thousands of dollars. Thousands of dollars that person doesn't have. And uh, so when you start working your way through how we get there, um, I don't know if they've done the math. And, and I'm just not sure uh, that this isn't putting pressure on the very, very people you're trying to help. 